Good evening, everyone. My name is Beth Ann Durstein, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Museum of Ceramic Art. I am delighted to welcome you to the first Digital Ceramic Arts Fund presentation. When the world closed down, we joined together with our community to find ways to support artists and create virtual conversations. All participating artists receive a micro grant to participate and 100% of the donations to the fund go directly to artists. I think we have all experienced the loss of seeing and being with art. We hope this conversation will help fill some of this void for you. Our first speaker is Stephanie H. Shee, a ceramic artist based in New York City. I'm standing next to some of her work in our current exhibition at Avoca, Making in Between Contemporary Chinese American Ceramics, which you can see online on our website. Stephanie H. Shee is a Taiwanese American artist living in Brooklyn, New York. Her work has been featured by National Public Radio, The Los Angeles Times, Vogue Magazine, The New York Times, and The New Yorker Magazine. Stephanie has invited Mei Lum to join her for this conversation. Mei Lum is the fifth generation owner of Wing on Woe and Company, the founder and director of the WOW Project, and one of the leading voices for placekeeping in New York's Chinatown. In 2019, she received the Community Builder Award from OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates and the Rubbinger Community Fellowship from the Local Initiatives Support Corporation. I'm excited to share with you that the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City has just announced that she will be a 2020 Civic Practice Partnership Artist in Residence. Please enjoy the conversation with Stephanie Shi and Mei Lum. My name is Stephanie H. Chi, and I am here with Mei Lum from Wing on Wong Co. and the WOW Project. And we're going to be in conversation today talking about ceramics, art, and activism, and how all those things, um, you know, play into each other. Uh, this is a part of the Digital Arts Fund that AMOCA has started recently, and so it's really exciting to be a part of this new initiative. Um, so, Mei, do you want to start by introducing yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited and thrilled to be in really good company. Um, my name is May. I am the fifth generation owner of Wing on Wo, which is the oldest operating store in the heart of Manhattan's Chinatown. Um, I'm also the founder and director of the WOW Project, which is a community initiative that's housed out of this store this space um, and we're using arts and activism as a medium to resist uh, the cultural displacement that's happening here in Chinatown. Great and so May and I first met when she invited me to be part of the first Asian American Ceramicist Fair that they held at Wing on Wong Co. A little bit of background about me, I am a Taiwanese American artist and I work primarily in clay, sometimes in installation. And my work um, explores the notion of home, especially for the Asian American diaspora. And the current series that I'm working on um, is a project of replicas from the Asian American pantry. So I'm recreating a lot of groceries that East Asian immigrants and their children uh, use in their homes. Um, so, May, can you tell me a little bit? I know that Wing on Wo is the oldest store in Chinatown. I know that it was started by your great grandfather, um, but if you could just tell us a little bit about like the family history there and how you came to be the owner and what you've been doing with the place. Yeah. Um, so the shop Wing on Wo has been in my family since 1890, um, which marks the very beginnings of when Chinatown was starting to form and be established here in Manhattan's Chinatown. Um, we started as a general store, so we sold a lot of um, dried goods, we sold a lot of taste of home. Um, we also acted as an informal postage service for recent immigrants to send letters uh, to and from China, um, and only became a specialty porcelain shop 
1964 when my grandmother took over. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, so I, we had like a small collection of porcelain from the very beginning, but it didn't become full blown until 1964. So I'm thinking about like your pantry items that your replicas that you've been making and um, just how that kind of harkens back to 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 the original incarnation of what the shop was like. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah. Like home and um, how how these these um, staples, these home staples really make folks feel like they're at home in a new place, um, right. especially in New York, especially in America. Um, so yeah, that's the history. I um, love the idea that that's what the shop was when it started. I guess I had never really thought of that in part because I thought of it more as a porcelain specialist, which it is now, but that, you know, it really was this community center in a burgeoning Chinatown for people who are in a completely new and foreign place. Yeah, definitely. I think also there, at the time, there are a lot of these stores, these general stores that acted as informal community spaces. Folks hung out in them, they gathered, they gossiped, they convened. Um, we also had an herbalist at one point. Right. Um, so it was like an everything store, you know, you like go like a Chinese bodega almost. Right, um, right. Um, I, so I guess the audience doesn't know this, but I know that all of the work that you guys source now is hand painted designs that are becoming increasingly rare, even in China that you guys source directly from China. Can you talk to us about the designs and how you choose them? Yeah. Um, so the way that we started sourcing our porcelain, my grandparents, um, started off their whole sourcing trips in Hong Kong at the time. My grandfather immigrated from Hong Kong and he was familiar with uh, with the language, with the place. And so that felt natural um, as a first step in, a first step and a first foot in the door in um, sourcing. And so a lot of the pieces that we still have a small collection of uh, were hand painted in Hong Kong. Um, the designs aren't being painted anymore. They're discontinued. Those painters aren't painting anymore. And that knowledge, you know, you think about um, just how that gets lost, right? And and traditions and um, the way that things are getting manufactured now. There's a lot of decals, which are stickers that you transfer onto the porcelain. Mm -hmm. um, you glaze them, you fire them, and they're just you know, good decals are expensive and they look hand painted, but they're actually not. And if they're done badly, you can tell where the sticker did not transfer. So yeah, there's like a, I think for us, we, um, now after my grandmother has passed the business to me, um, we've been trying to, you know, honor that Hong Kong sourcing legacy, but also, go straight to the source. Um, I source with my, one of my best friends, Nate Brown. Um, and we go to the porcelain capital, Jingda Jun, um, and source everything from small workshops from individual artists. Um, and it's a really cool way to have a hand in the production, um, work with individuals and also support, um, small businesses. Right. So yeah. It feels like in the same line and in the same heart as what we're doing here in the shop. Um, have you been to Jingdezhan before? No, I really want to go. I know that I should really go. Should now is no longer the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I really want to go. I've been thinking about doing a residency at the Pottery Studio. Um, I think one of the things that's most interesting to me about the work you source is how intricate it is right like you were saying that people don't really want to make this work anymore it's really labor intensive people often talk to me about how intricate my work seems but I just feel that I could never do what the artists in Jing De Zen are doing um yeah the work is just so delicate and I know that they must be so um I don't know, adept at doing it, right? Because they do it all the time that they must be so fast at it. And I think that that just really blows my mind. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's also interesting to think about the ways in which our ideas and perceptions of China color the ways in which we see these pieces that 
take so much time that are detailed that are very laborious to make. But for some of us, you know, in our mind's eye, we think of factories, we think of um, big machinery. We don't think of like the humanistic side of sure. the work that is created. And so um, I, it just made me think about how folks walk into the shop often and they expect, you know, a certain price um, yes. for our pieces to be sold at even though, you know, all of what you said that it takes a lot of time and labor to make these pieces, to hand paint them, to, you know, have this beautiful end product that, that folks see on our shelves. So I think not only is it our perception, our perception of China, but it's also our perception of Chinatown too. Right. And, and, yeah. Um, and that whole thing. So, right. It, there's this weird dichotomy of Wing on Woe starting as a place for Chinese immigrants and now Chinatown has become or is increasingly become gentrified. I know that that's, that's an issue that you guys are dealing with a lot there um, and that it's very tourist heavy, right? So whereas the shop used to be for Chinese immigrants, now I imagine a lot of your clientele are non-Asian tourists. Yeah, um, I feel like we're really fortunate that in that we have like a really strong community mm -hmm. um, based in New York, an Asian American community nationally that are supporting us. Um, and I think it's, it's the, it's also due to a lot of the community work that we're, that we're doing with the WOW project yeah. um, and the conversations that we're trying to have about identity and culture and tradition and, um, what does it look like for tradition to be passed down from generations? And, um, you know, can it be reinterpreted? Can it be made our own? I think that's something we're always thinking about um, as a family. And mm -hmm. it comes out like in the ways that we source our, our ceramics, um, trying to look at young um, Chinese ceramicists that are doing really innovative things that are playing off a of tradition, but um, so brings some of their own flavor and modern, modern techniques. Um, and then also like in the conversations and programming we hold with the WOW project, um, we're also trying to explore um, those different elements of identity and tradition. To go back for a second to talk about pricing, it's, it's what a complicated topic, right? Like I, my work is seen as quote unquote art by the art world and so i've been able to price it high but then i know that wing on woe is selling quote unquote pottery right which is functional ceramics and like you said people just have an expectation of what that should cost and again like you said with the prejudice or the ideas around products from china like what should that cost and so yeah, there was definitely a point in my own practice where I was still making functional pottery um, and I was doing paintings on it, right? So it was kind of like a halfway between, you know, where I had started with functional work and then slowly moving into these painted sculptures. And I stopped making mugs because I couldn't charge enough for my labor, right? Like we, everyone interacts with ceramic wear every day, whether it's their plates from Ikea or their mugs or whatever. And so they really have an expectation of what that should cost. And, you know, making a small painting on a mug takes me as long as it took me to make a large painting on a platter, like a big serving platter. But I could sell the serving platter for so much more because it was this halfway point between like a decorative object and a functional piece of pottery. Um, yeah. It's interesting to think about. And I think for us, you know, that that rings true, a lot of what you said and how we're trying to bridge that gap is through education and mm -hmm. sharing stories and sharing process, um, you know, using the power of social media, which I know, you know, and are familiar about. Um, to take folks on our sourcing trips to show the the ways in which our our pieces are made and to let folks know, you know, we are um, we're 
on our hands and knees, like cleaning stuff. We're searching for vintage pieces. We're working really closely with our small workshops and studios to um, make it an iterative process. So we get the painting down. Like, I think the education piece is missing for for a lot of folks. Like they're not really familiar how even ceramics are made, right? Like right. They're, they're made by machines, like I mentioned before, in factories, and they don't think they're hand thrown or that they're, um, you know, that there's somebody like sitting there for hours painting them. Right. And, Even with my work, sometimes people are like, okay, I'll need like two large sculptures in the next three weeks. And it's like, I couldn't even be done a third of the process in that time because ceramics takes a really long time. Yeah. Um, I think you do a good job of like showing your process to on, on your social media, right? Like sharing what it looks like when you hand build it. And then when you paint, when you draw the design on it, like I mm -hmm. think, I don't know. I'm surprised that folks are, <laughs> are asking <laughs> you to create those sculptures in you know, in a short amount of time because you're one person and right. things are detailed. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see how social media is changing the way artists interact with their audience and their collectors. I think that up until more recently, and even still now, artists often feel like, okay, I can't show anything until it's done, right? Because I don't, once it's out there, I no longer own this image, or maybe I'm giving too much away. You know, there's a, especially in the ceramics community, there's always a lot of secrecy around what are the materials you're using? Yeah. Um, what's your process? Where do you get your clay? And I just, I hate that kind of gatekeeping, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, if you have, if you're using a paint, which is an underglaze, for example, which is commercially available, then how could that be something proprietary to you? And so it's always been really important to me that I be very transparent. Whenever anyone asks me a question, I try to be very um, open about my process and my resources and whatever. But also just to go back, oh, sorry, um, just to go back a little bit in terms of social media and the process, I've wanted to be transparent about that as well. I think both because I'm a child of the internet and have posting disease, um, but also because, yeah, I want people to see what goes into it. And I think that that does help people appreciate the work more, right? To see how many steps there are in making a single painted piece. Right. On that, on that point, I'm just wondering, um, just thinking about like the different folks who follow you and who are fans of your work, who, who are you making your work for and who is your ideal audience that you'd like to interact with your work and your pieces and your whole like vision? Yeah. So when I started this project two years ago, I did not have a thesis in mind. I didn't have this huge plan. I did, had no idea that this project would change my life so much, would change my career so much and become a whole thing. Um, so when I first started following the dumplings in 2018, I think I was making the work for white people. Like I, I knew I was like, okay, white people love dumplings. And if I make these, they will buy them and I need uh, the money. I need an income, right? And so that's kind of where the project started, but very quickly it morphed because the Asian American community had such a strong reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And my work has been really, I would say it's much more reactive um, than it is about my vision and what I want to put out there. So I have been responding to my viewers responding to me. Uh, and so now the project has become much more about creating a community for Asian Americans, especially ones raised by immigrants or ones who have newly immigrated and exploring the sense of nostalgia, right? So when you're raised in diaspora, when you're not raised in your quote unquote motherland, the goods that you have to choose from are all imported. 
And so there's a very limited number of what happens to be available in the states. And so I think that that is part of the reason that so many of us remember the same exact brands of oyster sauce or sesame oil or, you know, the snacks that we grew up with. And so it's been, I've been trying to dig into the sense of shared nostalgia, right? Like I, I'm not that interested in personal nostalgia. I think that that's like fine and a little sentimental, whatever, but there's something really complex and, uh, I don't know, just really fascinating about these memories that you share with millions of other people that you didn't grow up with and might have grown up, you know, across the country from us, but we still have the same feeling about Morinaga milk caramels, right? Or or whatever it is. So yeah, I guess to, to answer your question, now it very much is for the Asian American community and not for the white gaze, but I often think about how the project started in a very different place. Yeah. How do you navigate those two different gazes? Because I, I mean, it, you know, it, like you said, you're interacting with the Asian American community. It's very organic. Um, a lot of the pieces that you choose to make are pieces that you pull in your Instagram stories, right? Like. Mm-hmm asking folks which brand of soy sauce they remember or, you know, things like that. But how do you, yeah, there's like a continuity, right? And navigation of those two things. Like you're interacting with the Asian American community, but you're also interacting with white gallery spaces. You're interacting with possibly other folks that are interested in purchasing your pieces. Um, How do you... Yeah, how do you balance that and how do you reconcile those two audiences, I guess? So I feel like I have been fairly lucky as far as my audience goes. I think a lot of people who have, you know, 10, 15,000 people following them online often get many more trolls. And I've been surprised and grateful that very few people have responded in a trollish way to my work or to my ideas. Even when I say, you know, I'm making this work for my community, everyone's been really respectful. And I think, you know, now with all of the identity politics that are in the news with Black Lives Matter and the way we're thinking about whiteness and white supremacy, I feel lucky that my work is existing in the same time as those conversations, because I think Mm -hmm. that White gallerists, for example, have for the most part, not entirely, um, been very respectful of, you know, my point of view and really interested in in bringing that point of view into their spaces. In terms of non-Asian people wanting to buy the work, I definitely don't want to gatekeep, you know, who can have these memories or who can have, you know, an attachment to a piece or even just appreciate a certain piece as art, even if they don't have a personal connection to it. And so I'm, I definitely don't uh, pull away from non-Asian folks who want to buy the work or support my practice. I'm, I'm really grateful for, for that. And again, I'm just happy that I don't have any trolls. <laughs> I'm curious about how you see your work growing and evolving over time and how you're going to build off of this idea of shared nostalgia, shared community. What does that look like in, yeah, in your process and your practice? Um, I'm interested to hear about that. I, I would love to say that I have this like grand plan, but I really don't because the, The work has been, like I said, so reactive, right? So right now, um, I have a show up at Periton online of 16 16 soy sauces. uh, And I made that 
series because of some microaggressions I got around, you know, people, white people making comments about my work that felt um, a little tokenizing about about, I guess, about Chinese food in general. And so I was really nervous to make soy sauce because soy sauce is this kind of like tokenized ingredient in Chinese food where it stands in for the white view of Chinese cuisine in a way, even though Chinese cuisine contains multitudes, obviously it's a giant country. Um, and so when I finally made soy sauce, I knew I wanted to represent as many cuisines and cultures as possible. And so in my full series, there are, I think, 13 or 14 different countries represented. There's all sorts of soy sauce I never even knew about, like ketchup manis um, from Indonesia, which I didn't even know how to pronounce until recently. I thought it was like kikap mani, which is apparently ketchup manis. Um, yeah. And so in terms of what is next, I don't really know. You know, I... I really am taking the lead of my audience um, and seeing what they're interested in. Um, I think that a lot of traditional artists or, you know, traditionally in the art world, that that wouldn't be a very good answer to that question, right? I think that artists are have in the past been expected to have a very strong vision that they want to put out, uh, regardless of who likes it or who wants to buy it. But this project really is about the community and the shared experience. And so I think that that's why um, that makes sense for my work. Yeah. So I don't know how to answer the question. I know you, I know you didn't arrive at um, ceramics or becoming a full-time artist in a traditional, like the traditional path. I'm mm -hmm. wondering um, how it feels right now to kind of be like fully in that embodied artist personality and role yeah. um, given like, you know, your past careers and like how you, how you kind of came to ceramics and painting Oh. Yeah. So I came to clay almost as a form of art therapy. I have a chronic back issue, which means that I'm in pain almost 24 seven since I was 14. So I guess it's been 20 years now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and I was in a particularly difficult time in my life. I was in a lot of pain at that time. I was spending most of my time in bed very depressed. And my partner at the time said, you really, I think you should get out of the house. You know, I know that art used to be really important to you. Let me, why don't you tell me what type of art you would like to pursue and I will buy you some classes. And so that's how I got back into clay, which I hadn't used since high school. And I think that it was really important for me to be able to use this medium and use my body in a way uh, for good instead of for pain. Uh, so I think that that's, yeah, why ceramics became really central to my life, because it kind of played this important role. Um, but I feel really lucky that I'm able to make my work full time. And it's allowed me to be really flexible with my schedule. For example, um, recently, I've been spending a lot of time protesting out in the streets, you know, for about six weeks, I was going out basically every day. And I was able to put all of my work on the back burner, because I make my own schedule. And that was really important to me. And I know that that's a privilege that not everyone has, you know, I know that you, for example, you had the store and you had to make sure that, you know, your family's like livelihood could, could survive whatever is going on right now. So yeah, um, but maybe that's a really good segue into us talking about community organizing stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the WOW Project is doing in Chinatown and how you're using art for activism? Yeah, um, just as some background context, I arrived at the work with the WOW Project through a very pivotal moment with my family. Um, my family owns the building. Um, my family has, as I mentioned, been stewarding this shop since 1890. 
um, in this in our current location since 1925. Um, and in 2016, my family was about to let go of the space um, cell. And that's when I had moved back to New York and started to transition. Um, and, and really, I think it was just, uh, just a really lucky series of events that led me to take on the ownership of the shop, run it, and then start the WOW project. Kind of similarly to what you were talking about, um, really driven by the conversations that I was having with folks in my community and really not, not having a vision, kind of just going with it organically and, and realizing that it's, it's really become bigger than me in a lot of ways. Right. And so um, we started the WOW project out of generative conversations that we were having with different residents, property owners, um, activist artists, um, started by my friend Diane Wong, who was doing a dissertation at the time on mm -hmm. gentrifications of Chinatowns across the U.S. And that really brought me out of my own like family bubble and realizing the ripple effects that letting go of this building might have on my block, might have to the larger Chinatown community. And that led me to, yeah, to take on ownership and do all of these things that I'm doing now um, and start to hold these conversations in more community wide settings. Um, naturally the only space I had access to was the storefront. And so that's how it really started with summer series talking about um, the influx of galleries in Chinatown in the Lower East Side and what that meant for us. And if there was any way for us to collaborate, could we coexist? Um, could we talk through kind of our own perceptions of each other to get to a better place? Um, as you can imagine, that was a tense conversation. Yeah. Um, and what was the conclusion of that? There wasn't really a conclusion, I think. Um, we got a lot of no's for participation in the conversation. We had um, only one gallerist um, participate wow. um, and, and the curator from MOCA who participated in the conversation. So I think, you know, the, the elephant wasn't really physically in the room, but um, we were all kind of like talking around, you know, these commercial galleries that have moved down here in Chinatown and, and, in a lot of ways, they feel like they're bringing culture to the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, without realizing that there is so much rich culture and tradition here. And, and that really speaks to what we're trying to do with the WOW Project in honoring, uplifting, and amplifying that, but also trying to really cultivate a sense of belonging and ownership amongst the younger generation mm -hmm. to vision for our future, to take hold of that and really run with it um, and know that like you were saying, you know, art can be the vehicle and the medium to do that. Um, it can be healing. It can be therapeutic. It can be um, a way to spread awareness about issues that are going on. Um, I think, you know, what we're seeing now with the historic uprisings is that, you know, art is a tool that can really bring us together and that can bring awareness to some really complex issues. So I didn't I hadn't made the connection between the art galleries, the, you know, white owned art galleries that were moving into Chinatown with why the WOW project might have focused on art. I, I, that's that's a really interesting connection. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, it was definitely a, a thing that informed us in honing in on some of our programs. For example, we have our a storefront residency program that we offer. Um, and, you know, a lot of that conceptualization took into account that we want our installation to live and breathe with the street and the neighborhood and the people who walk past. We want it to be accessible. We want it to reflect our community. And in these gallery spaces, that's not the case. It's a white box. It's inaccessible, you have to walk in, you have to look a certain way to even engage with the folks that work there. Right. Um, yeah, so it is like a that program specifically is a direct resistance and challenge. Um, I love that. Yeah, and 
I don't know. I, I struggle because it's like, how much do we want to be in conversation and like sit at the table with these folks when they already have their preconceived notions of who we are, what we're like, what our community is like. Um, and it's that same thing that we were talking about earlier with stereotypes, with how Chinatown is um, seen by other folks. And it's just, you know, we're trying to remind people that Chinatowns were started out of necessity, out of survival, out of um, racial exclusion and oppression. So the fact that, you know, now they're seen in this very voyeuristic, touristic view is almost ironic in a lot of ways. And, um, right. you know, I think connects to, to the movement for Black Lives and that um, the Chinese community was excluded and the very first law that was put in place to exclude uh, an ethnic group was the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Um, and that's why Chinese folks, POC, BIPOC, like we all should stand together to, to, push, to push back and fight for racial equity. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. Like, I just feel that having an interracial coalition is more important than ever in terms of pushing back against white supremacy and, um, yeah, in the fight for Black lives in general. Um, it's interesting, when as you're talking about the galleries in Chinatown and whether or not to be in conversation or how to be in conversation with them, I know that you and I um, both had an interaction with a white-owned gallery that recently moved into Chinatown. And thinking about that experience, it's just, it's really complicated, right? So for background for people who are watching, I was invited to um, show my work at a new gallery in Chinatown, but the more I spoke to the white gallerists, the more I felt that I was being tokenized. They wanted to be seen as a gallery that was welcoming to the existing residents. And so they wanted to like put art gallery and Chinese characters outside and then have have a artist who was of Asian descent, you know, showing work there. But the more we spoke about it, it just felt like they weren't interested in my the message behind my work. They hadn't um, read up about, you know, my, my vision for the project. And they just wanted to say, look, we're here and we have a Chinese artist. Isn't that good? Um, yeah, so it's really complicated. It's very complicated. Yeah, and I, I'm to that point, I think that's why it's so important to have spaces that are by and for folks here and that are by and for Asian Americans. Um, for us, you know, that's at the heart of what we do. We want to support folks here. We want to have it as a launching pad for folks to do bigger and better things beyond us. Um, we want to nurture people here. And I think that's something that um, was missing for me personally in, in visiting other art spaces and also thinking about women and non-binary folks specifically here in the history of Chinatown. They haven't had much leadership um, in determining, you know, the future of our neighborhood. And, and that's important to us as well in, in making sure that we are written into our future and our history. Um, so, you know, you, there, are, there are always going to be folks who are trying to have their agenda and, and use you in a way that checks off boxes. Of course. Um, you know, borrowing terms that are brought up today, like performative allyship, like, damn, I know what that <laughs> means. <laughs> and you know, you just got to be able to see through, see through intentions and authenticity. Yeah. Um, thinking about spaces and, and art, which is for us and by us, it's not that I want to gatekeep and say, oh, a white person can't make a Korean moon jar or can't make a sake set or can't make a Japanese teapot. 
But I think the question there for me is, what's your connection with it, right? And how, uh, how deep can it go? Or how do people from the cultures that you're borrowing from see the work? How do they interact with the work? And why are you making the work? Um, I don't think there are right and wrong answers, but like a, I think that it would be very hard for a white owned gallery space to ever feel as inviting as a place which is for us and by us, like the space that you're creating with WOW and the WOW Project. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's a really interesting thing to think about, you know, like other folks making work that is inspired by other cultures. Mm -hmm. For me, what's important is like honoring the history of it and, and the origins and where it came from. And it's okay to say, hey, this is inspired by a Korean moon jar. This is inspired totally. by Wanshou Wujiang paint, hand painting in Jing Dezhen. Like, that's totally okay. We're not saying you can't use that as inspiration, but I think it's important to honor that um, and speak that uh, and not own it as your own because that becomes appropriation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so um, May, talking about, you know, for us bias spaces and supporting Asian artists, Asian American artists, and ones actually from China, um, could you tell everybody about how people can visit the shop virtually and what they can find there? Yeah, so we're really excited to be hosting our third annual Asian American Ceramicist Fair this year virtually. That'll happen in the winter. Um, you can keep your eye out for that and also check out our pieces virtually vintage and new. We just got a shipment um, on our website, www.wingonwoand.co. I'll type it in the chat so you can have that. And you can follow us on Instagram and social media at Wing on Mo and Co. I really love all the work that you guys are bringing into the space. Um, I recently just bought this beautiful bowl for my mother that was uh, inspired by, I think you said the Tang Dynasty, right? Um, it, it's this like beautiful burnt orange bowl with a horseman and a few figures. And it's just really beautiful. She loved it. Oh, yay. I'm so happy. Yeah, she really, really liked it. <laughs> was she like, oh, Stephanie, can you make something like that now? <laughs> <laughs> I think of, like, my art. She's like, okay, this is better. It's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And how about you? What is coming up and how can folks follow along on what you're doing, what you're making, and how you're evolving your practice? Uh, so at the time that we will be launching this video, I will have a show, a virtual show up at Periton. That is P-E-R-R-O-T-I-N.com. It'll be under the viewing salons. Um, you'll be able to see my latest work, the 16 soy sauces, some dumplings. And there's some really special photos that will be part of the online exhibit from the grocery store that I went to when I was growing up. I contacted the... <gasps> The, they, the family that ran it, they had a child my same age. His name is Ray. I reached out to him. We hadn't spoken in probably 20 years. And I was like, I can't stop thinking about your parents' store. And, you know, it has such an important place in my memory. Um, and so I asked him if he had any photos. And he got me these photos from, like, 1989 to 1992 that are just so precious to me and so we're going to include those in the online show and i'm really excited for everyone to see that. yeah so in addition to the show at periton right now obviously i'm also in the show at amoka making in between uh i'm so honored to be in this exhibit with these other five other artists i love the way amoka has curated it um in case people aren't familiar with the show it is six Chinese American artists, three um, who are, you know, uh, roughly my age and in my generation, we're in our thirties, and then three who are in a previous generation, and we're all making work that explores Chinese American identity. And I love seeing how, 
you know, these two generations of Chinese Americans are interpreting these ideas in different ways. Um, they've made a really incredible virtual tour of the show that you can go see on amoka.org. If you want to um, follow my work and see my progress pics, you can find me on Instagram at Stephanie H. She, my last name is S H I H. Um, yeah, and I have posting disease, so I post all the time there. Uh, yeah. Um, as a last thing, though, May, is there anything you want to recommend? Um, anything you've seen lately or any artists that you follow that you want people to know about? Yeah. I have thinking a lot about futures and just a, kind of building off of what I was talking about, about imagining, imagining ourselves into our futures and what that looks like. And I'm really into Octavia E. Butler right now. I'm reading Parable of the Soar, which mm -hmm. is an amazing sci-fi book um, by a Black feminist. And I'm also reading Minor Feelings by oh. Pong, which is also kind of very pertinent right now in this moment um, as an Asian American and thinking about ourselves in relationship to um, Black and Indigenous, Black and Brown folks. Um, I'm also really honored to be part of um, a residency program at the Met this year and I'm in Congrats. in the company thank you and in, in the company of like some really incredible artists and I just want to uplift them and amplify them Miguel Luciano is an incredible Puerto Rican social practice artist and he does a lot of work around um, Puerto Rico and amplifying um, what's happening there right now and you know the the fraught relationship with the U.S. um and colonization and all that. And Bushy Regan is also an amazing musician, also very social justice based. So I'm listening to her work as well. How about you? I love that. Um, I think the thing I've been thinking the most about recently with you know the uprisings and everything is the abolition of the police and carceral state. Um, it's something that I came to a few years ago through the writing of Mariam Kaba. Um, and yeah, it's been really uh, surreal to see the idea of police abolition gain so much mainstream traction. I did not think that that would ever happen. Um, I have a tattoo that says abolish the police. And when I got it, people uh, were very confused about it, felt like it was a little extreme. Um, but yeah, like, so being out on the streets and seeing all these young people call for police abolition um, has been really exciting. So I would definitely say check out the writing of Mariam Kaba, Ruth, Wilmore Gil uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, and then also there is a book by Alex S. Vitali called The End of Policing. I think those are all great places to start. I know Mariam Kaba in particular uh, recently had an op-ed in the New York Times that I thought was a really great explainer and a good way in to um, the ideas around abolition. Wait, okay, so did you get that tattoo recently or way before abolition got? No, I got the tattoo in, I think, 2017. Um, it was after the cop who murdered Philando Castile was um, I guess, I think it was like he was ultimately not charged or maybe it was when he like uh, was found innocent or, you know, there was, there was a decision in that case that was very disappointing. You know, that, I don't know if you remember that particular mm -hmm. shooting, but there was, there was footage of it and it was just so clearly um, an act of murder. And so he, he died in 2016 and so I had been I had been pretty active in the protesting, you know, since I I guess I think Trayvon Martin was in 2012. So between 2012 and 2014, 2014 and 2016, I was pretty active, um, and so that was definitely um, a painful blow. And I had been thinking more and more about abolition then. So that's when I got the tattoo. <laughs> Wish we could talk more. I feel like there's so much other stuff we didn't unpack. But excited and yeah, thank you so much for 
Yeah, thank you for participating. And thank you to Amoka, of course, for having us and for the Digital Arts Fund, which made this possible. Um, and yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.